Hello, welcome to my channel and thank you for being here. Today I'm going to share an artist talk I delivered in October 2021 for the Built Museet in Umeå in Sweden on the theme, What is Art For? The Built Museet to commemorate 20 years or so of its uh, or longer, I think, existence, invited several artists to speak on this theme. And um, I'll share a link in the description below so you can uh, also check out some of the other uh, talks. Some of them, I mean, yeah, most of them very interesting um, talks, I believe. So uh, for the sake of archiving and uh, sharing as well, I'm uh, reading this talk I delivered then. Um, once again, for the purposes of my channel. My talk um, was, it is entitled A Global South Perspective by Cedric Nunn. I came to photography having recognized early on its critical function in society and my potential to engage with it as a medium to record and expose my country's apartheid engineered dysfunction. Today, I proudly carry the moniker of struggle photographer from that early engagement, which continues to define the nature of my involvement and approach to photography, namely that of criti critically examining the society into which I was born and in which I continue to live. Artists are often at the vanguard of humanity's philosophical thoughts and critical inquiry as well as serving as a mirror for society to self-reflect. This function becomes critical at bifurcation points, such as the global phase shift currently underway. Artists have a critical role to play in determining the paths that humanity takes through these epochal shifts. Physically, I am located and reside on fourth generation family land and am myself a fourth generation hybridized South African, meaning I am of mixed race descent, categorized as colored in South African parlance, a, a designation peculiar to our land and its hyper-racialized past. All my European ancestors who came to South Africa as settlers to the Cape Colony in the 1800s married Africans, which violated the British and Dutch settler code of the time, and made my European patriarchal ancestors outcasts in the colonial order from which they emerged. A legacy that endures and continues to haunt their descendants to this day. My African matriarchal ancestors were largely first-generation Christian recruits which also made them outcasts at the time from the African societies they had been part of. The children of these unions were essentially orphaned in that they had little or no ties to the families or communities from which their parents originated. The entire province of KwaZulu-Natal, in which I reside, is dominated by the monocrop sugar with its feudal slave wage and labor conditions still the order of the day, a legacy of our extractive colonial past. This industrial agricultural monocrop continues to be the dominant contributor to the province's e economy. Its pro profits still reaped by only an elite few. While the bulk of the sugar industry's workers struggle in a sea of poverty, an ongoing going disparity seemingly entirely devoid of and exempt from any critique by the local or national media. Not 10 kilometers from my home is the Isitebe Buddha Industrial Park, built by the apartheid regime to exploit an addiction by business and industrialists to cheap labor from captive natives in the adjacent tribal homeland of KwaZulu, of then KwaZulu, which today lies largely inactive and moribund. 
the adjoining dormitory township of Sundumbili, created to house uh, the industrial workers, is now also host to endemic unemployment and crime. The township of Sundumbili was also the epicenter of the HIV AIDS epidemic that swept this land. South Africa, with its origins in 1652 as a corporate control controlled entity, and now firmly embedded and captive to its corporate settler and colonial past, and now neo-colonial colonial present, as well as its current neoliberal economy, wrestles and rides with the contradictions of this past and present, which manifest in legalized corporate wealth extraction, slave wage labor conditions, extreme wealth versus poverty inequality, mass unemployment, corruption, little to no investment in its people, and a loss of hope. Indeed, the entire continent of Africa is tied to the neo-colonial yoke of its past, hobbled by the underdevelopment dictated by the Western-controlled financial instruments of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the like, and doomed through the dictates of neoliberal economics to provide its global role as suppliers of cheap resources, both human and mineral, to the producing and dominant West. South Africa emerged from its apartheid past at a critical juncture, as a new world order was emerging, dominated by the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of a unipolar superpower, the United States of America, with its particular brand of globalization, cementing our role in the neoliberal economic order as subalterns and vassals condemned only to be suppliers of cheap resources. Today, as the working and middle classes of the West, traditionally the heartland of the economy of rampant wealth extraction globally, and typified as beneficiaries of the capitalist and imperialist economic order, find, ourselves, find themselves increasingly dispossessed, subject to the logic of wealth accumulation as well as the erosion of hard-won civil liberties, diminishing incomes and astronomically increasing wealth disparity. They too experience the rise of discontent and take to the streets in protest. This global zeitgeist is today compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic, which seems here to stay. Viruses have been with us since the beginning of life itself and indeed are a part of life. Scientifically, our understanding of these biological processes have, have never been as advanced as they are now. Apart from medically controlling viruses through vaccines, for example, we also have sophisticated understandings as to the prevention of the emergence and spread of viruses, which begs the question as to where our current failure to contain, contain the virus originates. Is it not in the actual failure of our econ economies to lift people out of poverty, itself a main driver of the emergence and prevalence of viruses? Is it also not the failure of both our neoliberal economic systems and the pharmaceutical and health sector to respond adequately to the viral outbreaks themselves? Is it not the privatized profit motive that is the main driver of our medical responses? which is midwifed by politics, i.e. politicians who ensure the profitability and economic success of the industry and its corporate players and stakeholders. While we have the understanding, technology and ability that is necessary to respond adequately to combat deadly viruses, we lack or are encumbered by a monetary economic system stymied by the profit motive, which is facilitated by politicians who, while mandated by the citizens who vote them into power, indeed represent the corporate and shareholder oligarchical elite interests who pay for, the, for their campaign rise to power and to whom they are indebted. Hence, our systems work for the wealthy elite, many of whom display eugenics and Malthusian sen sentiments and abysmally fail us, the people. 
the majority of people in the world are without adequate health care, including those in the United States, the wealthiest country on the planet. We witness also, as a response to climate change, the attempts by this iniquitous capitalist economic order, itself facing the imminent collapse of the 1.2, probably 1.4 quadrillion dollar financial bubble masquerading as the Western economy to reinvent itself through shenanigans such as the Great Reset, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and the Green New Deal, which are global banker and neoconservative-led initiatives towards their new world order. But we witness, too, how rebellious natives resist their subaltern vassal status and are rising as economic powers, resisting the geopolitical devices that ensured their submission in the past and are now threatening the financier oligarchs with existential dread. In fact, the world is experiencing a significant epochal and hegemonic shift as it moves from a unipolar world order to a multipolar one, in which power moves, moves from west to east. The resultant contestations of this shift are of a geological, seismic nature, as the West resists losing its dominant position, bringing the machinations of age-old divide-and-conquer tactics that brought it to dominance into full play to retain the status quo. Here in Africa, we also witness the rise of AFRICOM with great trepidation, accompanied as it is by the rise of fundamentalist terror groups, we understand also that the theater of endless wars is now shifting from the Middle East to Eurasia and Africa as the great game manifests in denying the emerging economic powerhouse of Eurasia access to Africa's immense mineral resources, which are crucial to their economy, economy's growth. In this pivot, we see our continued subjugation and its accompanying five centuries long suffering cemented in these contestations as the West jealously guards its neo-colonial assets and fights off the newly emerging trading partner competition as it attempts to contain the rise of rival Eurasian powers and the imminent loss of he he hegemony. While our continent lies captive to an imperial empire, so does that of the South American subcontinent as well. As well as, until recently, most of Asia and parts of Eurasia, making a full two-thirds of humanity victims of a rapacious Western imperial system. A growing solidarity of the global South is emerging to confront and defeat the ravages of this present rules-based order, which is itself devoid of international law. This new alliance has premised its existence upon the principles of non-interventionism, national sovereignty, and the right of all nations to develop as enshrined in the UN Charter, and in total opposition to the rules-based order ideologues who only look at the world through the lens of a Hobbesian zero-sum game and a limits-to-growth matrix. This parasitical system's hegemonic hold on power is projected in ways that contribute to the disequilibrium subject, subjected on large parts of the global south, especially crit, uh, critical geopolitical choke points, while the rest is kept captive to non-growth and resultant dysfunction, contributing to a global existential angst of global division and renewed fears and anxiety of an annihilation through world wars and a nuclear or climate change Armageddon. How are, are artists to respond to such a world order? One that heralds a dark age, as grim as any Goya painting. As va vanguards of humanity's philosophical thought and critical inquiry, quest questing for freedom, beauty, and harmony, justice and peace, artists generally, generally respond as they always have, 
through a critical gaze, gaze into their societal and global realities and imaginings. We contemporary artists need to be cognizant, however, of the instrumental, instrument, instrumentalization, instrumentalization and weaponization of art and culture towards geopolitical and hegemonic ends, typified by, for instance, the Central Intelligence Agency and its Congress for Cultural Freedom as largely unwitting Cold War warriors, and question to what extent such intelligence operations perpetuate to this day, as we are exhorted by the very same forces to again embrace a new Cold War stance. Do we once again become those unwitting Cold War warriors, or worse, do we wittingly enter the fray on the side of the elites? In light of the above, we need to ask, is art a bipartisan affair? Does art have ideological constructs? Can cultures be pitted one against the other, with art as the agent that instrumentalizes culture? Is art and are artists different in one part of the world to the next? Or are there universal similarities that form a commonality? Does art take sides? And if so, which side? Does art solely serve its benefactors, largely the wealthy elite? As a creative act, art does, does art not reflect and perpetuate the very essence of life itself? Is art itself not a universal impulse in the employ of creation? The philosophical constructs within which artists find themselves embedded are key to understanding how artists react, respond, and create. Within an African and global South context, such philosophical approaches have largely been of a communal nature. Understanding humanity as a conjoined system, one dependent and interdependent on the other. In the Southern African context, this is articulated and understood through the notion of Ubuntu, the concept and philosophical state that is informed by the understanding and belief that I am because you are, and that all is connected. Whilst Ubuntu is alive and well amongst the people of Southern Africa who are largely still poor, landless, and exploited, it is rapidly receding amongst the emerging middle class and is a rarity amongst the wealthy elite. In fact, Africa's philosophical constructs were largely shattered and fragmented by the arrival of first the European industrial slave traders five centuries ago, who, through their supply of firearms to the native warlord raiders and local partners in crime, shattered and reorientated existing governmental and societal orders, causing mass migration from the coastal regions, which as a, res as a result were left denuded and collapsed, and largely supplanting the pre-existing order with warlords who met their trade needs and reshaped and reordered the societies that remained. This societal and philosophical fragmentation was cemented by the supplanting of the slave trade, trade with colonialism, its colonization itself, imposing through its dominant order Western iterations of religion, culture, and the emerging philosophies of the Enlightenment, articulated largely through the cult of the individual and the extractive priorities of the colonial project. It is this so-called freedom of the individual that largely animates contemporary African political and philosophical discourse, especially of the elites in defense of primitive accumulation. The West is, itself is, of course, largely bound by such thinking, clearly evidenced by the neglect of its own citizens, leaving them to the devices of their own individual capacities to provide for themselves, where an inability to meet one's own needs is perceived as abject failure that is no one's business but that of the individual themselves. To my mind, this 
suits a divide and conquer strategy most perfectly. If the world has been until now divided by West versus Global South binary, the Global South has been typified by an Ubuntu communal people-centered approach, expressed by systems such as communalism, communism, and socialism, which place the needs of the people above those of corporations and wealthy elites. This approach, which even though battered and undermined by the imperial efforts of empire and capital, remains alive and well, as I alluded to above, through its continued survival, despite being amongst the victims of this rapacious system. Art itself is not some immutable force, imperturbable to the material conditions in which it's, it resides. Inasmuch as art is an act of creation, occasioned by creation, it remains embedded in the social realities in which it exists and bound in its ability to project into society and beyond. Much like a plant in the shadow of a large tree is circumscribed by its geographical location. Its survival and growth depends on its ability to adapt to its particular situation. The societal context within which art resides is of critical importance, as it both affects and is affected by the art-making process. In light of the above, we see that globally, art remains firmly dominated by its Western iterations. The West, largely through monetary means, continues to, to, to determine broadly what constitutes art, its value, currency, and impact. Art has been industrialized with an overemphasis on commodification, scarcity or rarity, and speculation. And so, even as artists located in the global south, we are obliged to reflect on this hegemonic paradigm and respond accordingly. When looking to the order of the West, what is it exactly that we see? We see that the philosophical values that describe the dystopian reality articulated, articulated above are the result of closed system thinking, as defined and articulated by Malthusian entropy, non-growth, and limits to growth. Scarcity and the resultant competition and management of diminishing resources, geopolitical divisions and wars, in which the biosphere obeys a mathematical equilibrium or stasis. This end of history paradigm views the universe in which we reside as one that is both empty and dying, and not expanding or defined by continual growth. It is a paradigm of austerity, in which resources are deemed finite, to be accumulated and hoarded, as they are by the elites, in which resources are to be won at the expense of others, a type of zero-sum thinking and paradigm in which the winner takes all. This closed system, as defined by Parson Thomas Malthus, Ricardo Darwin, J.S. Mills, Thomas Hobbes, and the Acolytes, sees an expanding population, indeed humans themselves, as a parasitical force impinging on nature. The nature understood by this Darwinian thinking is itself seen as inert and subject to entropy, and not substantial enough to be shared by all. Nature, seen as finite through this entropic lens, is to be de defended from humans, who themselves are seen as a destructive life, a form of animal life, bound by the forces of nature and unable to use creative reason to transform and trans uh, transcend themselves or nature itself. The measures used by these adherents of a closed system are chiefly austerity, debt, low slave wages, population control, privatization, which is the transfer of wealth upwards to the elites, geopolitics, which 
has been around since Babylonian times and is most recently expressed by the kind of thinking espoused by imperial geographer Halford Mackinder and the likes of geopoliticians such as Zbigniew Brzezinski, Henry Kissinger, and other neoconservatives. And its accompanying military economics and endless divide and conquer wars. The rentier neoliberal economics of Milton Friedman's Chicago School of Economics and the Washington Consensus, and the hoarding and managing of diminishing resources, demonstrated best in the 20 trillion, and today, less than two years later, it's 23 trillion, I think, <laughs> and rising, dollars or more stashed in offshore accounts by the elites. Systems analysis and cybernetics are at the basis of this mathematical and computer-generated vision and reality, which is itself a technocratic dictatorship of the type espoused by Toffler. To the above, one can add regime change wars and coups to put in place compliant vassal state managers, mass migration that results from the regime change wars, destabilization and economic blockades, covert sponsorship of terror terrorist groups in the service of regime change operations, narcotics economies, and mass opioid, opioid addiction. The employ of technology such as surveillance and its corollary in surveillance capitalism, artificially, artificial intelligence, automation, and corporate censorship. Narrative control via an almost entirely oligarch-owned mainstream, mainstream media is a vital component of the system, as is the mission creep of totalitarian legislation, such as the Patriot Act. The democracy that the West inflicts on the global south, south already problematized by Plato two million, millennia ago, is hardly to be found in the West itself where countries go through the routine every few years of electing an, ad an administration masquerading as a political party, representing the electorate, uh, electorate who voted it into power, where it immediately goes to work representing the techno-feudal interests of the oligarchical elites who paid for the political campaign. What is called democracy is in fact an oligarchy and the rule of the plutocrats. The Occupy movement clearly revealed this obvious fact a decade ago, where the concept of the parasitical 1% gaining its wealth and power at the expense of the 99% of humanity, and indeed a rapacious, rapacious abuse of the Earth's resources, became crystal clear to all. These malevolent 1% bad actors and their enablers cannot be entrusted with any reform or restructuring of society in ways which benefit hum human and other life forms and the ecological health of the planet. The global south, along with the long-suffering masses of the West, are bludgeoned into accepting this flawed system, rigged in favor of the elites, where they, where they along with the working class masses of the West, remain trapped in low-wage work if they are lucky enough to actually have a job. Masses of migrants, economic as well as those fleeing destabilizing wars and dysfunctional states, compete for low-wage jobs, jobs in the West, which in itself undermines the ability of workers in the West to maintain their hard-worn standards of living, subject as they are to the dictates of economic austerity. The Great Reset and Fourth Industrial Revolution, the World Economic Forum, along with the Green New Deal, promise a further and darker dystopian future, especially for us in the Global South. Elite figures such as the World Economic Forum's Klaus Schwab, whose self-proclaimed main influence is the neoconservative Henry Kissinger, and Mark Carney, former head of the Bank of England, who drive this Malthusian project, promise us that you will own nothing and be happy. This while they and their millionaire and billionaire associates own pretty much everything and work at resetting a defunct economy teetering on the verge of collapse in their own image. 
and with our manufactured consent. Here in the Global South, we are assured that we will not be allowed to be producers of the requirements needed to live, let alone thrive, and will be paid a fee, no doubt, set by the globalists for their natural settings, for the natural settings we reside in, in a carbon offset trade-off to barely survive. Naturally, in true mafia style, this directive, dictated by the very creators of the changing climatic conditions that we had absolutely no hand in producing, is an offer we cannot refuse. In other words, we are to remain trapped in the slave and servitude conditions that have existed since slavery, colonialism, and imperialism, and which are the products of these exploitative and sociopathic systems. And to spell it out clearly, this means that over a billion people in Africa will have to settle for what they have today, or it would be more appropriate to say what they don't have today. Access to clean water, food, education, and other basics of civilization. A counter-prevailing order to that of closed systems, thinking, is that of open system theory expressed and articulated best by Ukrainian-Russian biochemist, biogeochemist, Vladimir Vernetsky, where the biosphere, the thin envelope over the face of the globe, which shapes and is shaped by living matter, is not a closed system as defined by entropy, as is assumed by Darwinians but rather an open system shaped by the intersection of cosmic radiation and internal radi radiation emanating from within the Earth and is perceived as being in a state of anti-entropy in which life evolves in non-linear non leaps from lower to higher states of life and from unconscious life to conscious life and from conscious life to self-conscious thinking life. A higher process of creation of new systems is at play here, always moving towards expressing ever greater degrees of freedom of action and complexity towards the expression of human life. In open system theory, Resources are understood as infinite, subject only to creative access, and challenges are pure potential. In an open system, the biosphere is not only cosmic in nature, but a singular process directed by flow of creative disequilibrium towards ever higher states of anti-entropy. And creation. Not death, homogenization or decay. Vernetsky writes, and I quote, the creation resulting from new forms of living forms adapts itself to new forms of existence, augments the ubiquity of, of life, enlarges its domain, life penetrates thus, the regions of the biosphere where it had not earlier had access. End of quote. When humanity appeared on the scene, a new geological phenomenon began expressing itself in a form which Vernetsky described as the new sphere in which atoms are organized by human thought as opposed to the lithosphere in which atoms are organized in non-biotic nature and the biosphere in which atoms are organized in biotic nature, a new geological force to be driven by human creative reason, a new phenomenon on our planet, in which, for the first time, man becomes a large-scale geological force capable of rebuilding the province of his life by his work and thought, rebuilding it radically in comparison with the past as wider and wider creative possibilities open before him, guided by an asymmetrical harmony and progress 
from lower to higher states of organization. In Vernetsky's mind, neither the new sphere nor the biosphere obeyed a law of mathematical equilibrium or stasis. The world is thus at a crossroads. Indeed, large parts of it is crossing over to this new paradigm, departing from a centuries-old one defined by war, austerity, scarcity, dispossession, exploitation, inequality, degradation and lack, hunger and fear, into one of abundance in which all humanity is treated as equal and all life valued and deemed sacrosanct. The old order, with its endless wars, austerity and extreme inequality, is dying. And a new world, typified by millions of people emerging out of extreme poverty, is rising. And millions, if not billions, of people are rising to join this world of hope and possibility. As an artist, an observer and commentator of life located in the global south, I choose to embrace a concept of universal and earthly abundance and to forego fear and its concurrent notion of scarcity and lack, even as I myself live within the paradigms of a manufactured scarcity, austerity, and accompanying fear, holding firm to the knowledge of an abundant, expansive, and full universe. I see clearly that the scarcity that defines my world is not at one with the universal with the universal principles and, it's, and is entirely manufactured, a paradigm whose time is now passing. And I choose to align myself with the new energies that sweep the planet as we move from a unipolar world to one of multipolarity, where we employ our human ability to create a more abundant reality for all humans and indeed all life within our biosphere. As an African, perhaps it's fitting to conclude with an extract from a contribution I made to an intervention by Berlin's savvy contemporary at the 2019 Bamako Photography Biennale, named Exclamating Still on the Noise of Images, entitled Ancestral Invocation. And I quote, paraquoting, I think, myself. This great awakening of our connectedness to all that is, of our molecular connection to the micro, the biosphere, and to the stars, to the universe itself, a quantum connection to the supreme ancestor some would call the tree of life, as is and was recalled by the indigenes who still remember, is a rude awakening that we errant humans, custodians of all the earth, accused of dereliction of duty, that sacred duty to bestow an inheritance at least seven generations into the future, an inheritance we have squandered mostly while we slumbered, but mainly to avarice and greed. It's this awakening that is necessary. And it is the remembering of the ancestor that is critical to that awakening. That's the end of the quote, and that's the end of my artist talk. Hope you enjoyed it. And um, I'll end this here and say thank you um, for watching. And uh, more information on myself, uh, on myself and my work can be found in my, on my website a link to which, including my blog and email address, can be found in the video description below. If you like this talk, remember to click the like button and press subscribe. It helps the channel grow.